Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word, the book of 1 Peter. You know, that old fisherman, when Jesus just walked by, he didn't say, would you like to follow me? He said, follow me. There was no questions asked. He fell right in to serve the Lord. And what a servant he was in bringing forth the word and holding the truth, even holding the people together. For it would be Peter, even though he denied Christ thrice on the night Christ was crucified, that he would, uh, or was being judged to be crucified. Uh, he would be the one in Acts chapter 1 that would begin forming the church, the first 120 that came to that church. And then it grew mightily at the hand of this one, the rock. Bar Jonah, Christ would call him the son of the dove, the Holy Spirit. And uh, he was a good trooper. And we get right into it. We came to, we got through with verse 11 of chapter 3. I, I want you to hear verse 11 again where God is giving advice. He said, uh, for a person to be happy and to serve the Lord, let him eschew evil. That, that means avoid it. You, you, don't, you know something? You don't need it. Let, let other people take care of the evil, all right? You don't, you don't have time for it. Life is too short for that. And do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. That's what you want to do is, is grow. Wisdom is to know what to avoid. Don't argue with Satan. That's a waste of time. And don't ever feel that you know a person and you have the gift of being able to tell who's going to believe and who is not, because you don't. Don't waste your time casting pearls before swine. If somebody doesn't believe, that's tough. Go on to fertile ground. Uh, that's, God didn't expect you to spend your life being abused by people that are not going to accept him anyway, or at least the truth. So avoid it. It's not necessary. Plant a seed and only God can make it grow. If you ever wanted a verse that will give you good advice and will let you know and grow closer to your Father, it's the verse we're starting with today. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. Listen to it carefully. After avoiding evil, search for peace. Verse 12 reads, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. Do you know what righteous is? That means somebody that does things right. Not wrong, but right. And his ears are open. I repeat, his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against, I repeat, against them that do evil. So do you see why do you see why you can't afford to mess with evil? You need to avoid it. God won't have any truck with it. That is to say, if it tries to if evil tries to force itself upon you, get rid of it one way or the other legally. Okay? You don't have to put up with it. God has given you power over all of your enemies. But what does that verse say? It says, if you do right, and if you serve God right, it promises you he hears your prayers, but he's going to answer it as, as we uh, learned in the 15th verse of the last chapter, ask in the will of God, because God knows what's best for you. You see, he created your soul, he created all things, and he has election that are supposed to be doing his will and his work. Are you? If you are doing righteous, that means according to the word of God. God hears your prayers. And then, you know, these people that go against him and say, he never answers my prayers. Well, naturally, he doesn't answer prayers. He's against you. You can't expect him to want to bless somebody that's working against him, that's working against his children. I mean, do you appreciate people that work against your children? That's the way he feels about it. 
Stay away from evil. It isn't necessary in life. Put a stop to it, all right? And uh, I'm not telling anybody, if you think I'm saying be a wimp, you don't know me. You, you just don't have to mess with it, all right? Verse 13 to continue. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? Well, if God's looking over the evil or he's against the evil and he's looking out for you in your righteousness and good, um, uh, who's going to harm you because God's going to fix their plow, okay? God will see to it. You know, it's strange. A lot of people don't believe that, but I know from experience it is true. You want to uh, be real careful if you get into these evil groups that like to gossip and say bad things, about, lie about people. I guarantee you God will bring it down around your neck and it would be like, they, uh, like um, a, a chain of lead that you can't carry. God takes care of his elect, all right? Follow good, do that that is right. Have the ear of God on all of your prayers and um, don't have any truck with evil or propagating evil or participating in it or God will be against you. That's only common sense, right? Verse 14. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. In other words, if someone, let's say, well, now I've mentioned gossip, let's, if someone gossips about you and it brings a little bit of grief, don't worry. God's about to cut their pins right out from under them. Their terror is going to be terrible. Yours won't be that bad. They can't harm you. But, um, you know, a, a man, this is why that we were told by Christ himself in the final chapter of the great book of Mark that you can, the, his righteous can pick up serpents. What it means is, is it's an idiom that means um, that uh, gossip can't hurt you because your character will withstand any test. The same way as drinking poison. He didn't mean literally to drink something toxic. That's dumb. That'll kill you. But when they talk against a righteous person, their po that poison cannot hurt you. Do you understand that? It, as long as you are good and you're doing what's right, it doesn't matter what people say. You're going to be just fine. Well, how can God promise that? He's going to fix their wagon. Okay, you don't have to worry about it. Big time. Verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That means sanctify him in your minds. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness, that's to say humbleness, and fear. And here, my little old King James even has fear translated as reverence. That, that's, the miracles never cease, all right? But that's what it means, with humbleness and fear reverence. Why? Always be able to answer a question. People, what is it saying? Well, if you avoid evil and you carry God's blessings, his gift, people are going to come to you and ask advice or ask direction. Always be ready with an answer as to why God blesses you. That's simply a, a do it respectfully, protecting your credibility. You don't have to worry about it, all right? God takes care of his own when they take care of themselves and do it God's way. Verse 16, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. You be well-founded enough in the Word of God that when you answer a question, you can document it, okay? That you, could, you can bring that truth home. 17, for it is better if the will of God be so, if, if it is God's will, that's what you always want to remember, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. In other words, um, it, it, you're, if it is better for you to do good, and if somebody gossips a little, don't worry about it. 
if you do evil, God himself will be against you. If you don't do evil, if evil comes against you, God's going to handle it. He's going to take care of it. You don't have to worry. And this would take you back to that 12th verse. This is the answer to it. Back to 12 again. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. If they do evil against you, the Lord is against it, and he will he'll clean their little old plowshares real quick. Okay, You don't have to worry about it. Verse 18, and I'm not propagating a, a, a dogma here that uh, you should not even attempt to take care of yourself. That's not true. You know me better than that. 18, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins. I mean, he was crucified for them. The just for the unjust, he was perfect, we're not. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened, that means made alive, by the Spirit. And so he was made alive by the Spirit. What Spirit? The Holy Spirit, of course. <clears throat> Which is simply to say, his Spirit, Emmanuel, God with us. How precious our Father's word is in telling us how to find peace of mind in these flesh bodies, how to live in this flesh age and have everything down pretty pat with God's assistance, everything rolling our way. And even if a little trouble comes along, hey, it's, uh, you know, it keeps life from being so boring if, if it should be. It'll give you a, a good way to just test you out. Verse 19, <clears throat> by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. If you ever want to document that our Father is fair, what he's saying here is that even while he was in the tomb, this is to say Christ, that uh, as he would give the illustration in Luke chapter 16 of paradise with two sides to it, one is there's a gulf in between that no one can cross. Some are rejoicing with our Heavenly Father on this side, and on that side, they're long-faced. They're sad. Why? They didn't make it, and they know it. But um, <clears throat> how would they were God's children? I mean, let's, let's go back all the way to Noah, which he's, gonna, he's going to emphasize here in a moment. Did they have the opportunity that you do today to believe upon Christ and be forgiven? No, Christ hadn't died on the cross yet. But to show you that God is fair, while Christ was yet in the tomb, after the price was paid, he went to that side of paradise, or hell if you want to call it that, it's not. He went to that side and preached and gave them the opportunity to believe upon him and attain salvation and cross that gulf. Why? Because God is fair. It would have been very unfair for all of the children that were born before the crucifixion that would not have had advantage of the Savior as you do today. God just doesn't operate that way. So this is something that should really strengthen your faith that Christ went and he preached to the prisoners. Verse 20, for some time were disobedient, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing within few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. How many were saved though by the Holy Spirit? How many of them were saved by the Savior Christ? You can't number them. Uh, Revelation chapter 6 would document you can't number them. Man couldn't number them. Verse 21, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject <clears throat> excuse me, unto him. All things put under his feet. It means he's in charge. Do, uh, I want you to be sure and grasp that. Christ is in charge. 
angels, principalities, they all have to move as he says. And guess what? He's your advocate. Advocate means lawyer. From a, uh, from a spiritual leg legality, he is your spokesperson. He looks out for you. How, how wonderful and what a thing of love. For I, I could say, who are you? Who are you that this one that was perfect died on that cross and sits at the right hand of God right now and is your spokesperson looking out for you when you fulfill the qualifications of verse 12 of this chapter? You do, you're right. You try to do right. No, nobody's perfect. We never, we never get to that point. But you try. And that's counted as perfect by him. That he looks out for you. And do you understand God's ears are open to you? That he hears you when you make a request according to his will? That he's going to hear that request and he will answer it to his will, and his will is always what is best for you. That's what a mature Christian must always come to that realization. Chapter 4, verse 1. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, they pierced him, nailed him to that cross. Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. In other words, you put the gospel armor on and you especially arm your mind, your thought process, where you understand that for he that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. In other words, um, when you put your mind, what, this is kind of a bad translation. What it's really saying is when, when you arm your mind with the fact that he paid that price for us, and that you believe upon him to the point that you are a part of his resurrection into eternal life by believing that the um, flesh that wants you to sin at times has no power over you. It's nothing compared to the beauty of Christ sitting at the right hand of God as your spokesperson. You know, that could make a person feel real special, but a real Christian, it's so humbling, so very humbling, for his love pours out upon us as we know and realize that he died on that cross and he did not whimper, not one whimper, but he did it gladly. As we read in the chapter before, his body received the stripes, and we get the healing. And while he was even in the tomb, remembering those souls, the children of God, all the way back to the time of Noah, meaning the beginning, and preached to them and offered that same salvation to them, and many received it. We'll find that out here in a moment. Next verse, verse 2 that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. That is maturity, my friend. It couldn't be put in any better words for you to want the will of God. Three, for the time past of our life may suffice us, us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. That's to say the will of the world, the nations. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Now, I want you to have a, at the risk, I'll risk it. I want you to be sure that you note the word excessive, excessive wine. A little wine for the good of the tummy, as, as one would teach if one is not, does not have a problem. It is the excess that gets you in trouble. You understand? Don't, don't throw the baby out with the, 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 the bathwater, okay? In other words, listen to what you read, absorb it. Understand the problem 
And hey, you know, but still, it's your life. You live it the way you think best. But uh, as a teacher, I have to make certain that you understand where the problem lies in excess. Many things in moderation are fine. Excessive, mm hmm. Verse 4. Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. I mean, if you, you leave that old crowd and find a little bit of righteousness and truth and what it's like to be away from them, they're, they're not going to have much truck with you after that. I mean, I mean, it's just human nature. They can't help it. They're going to have to speak evil of you. And they might even make fun of your religion. That is, uh, Christianity is not a religion. However, it's a reality, and you know it. Verse 5. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? Do you know what that means? He that is going to judge the living and the dead. Do you understand? That's your father. And... Um, uh, you, you don't have to worry too much about giving account because it's written in the book. Every sin you've committed that you haven't repented for, it's in the book. All you have to do to have that erased or brought it out is to repent for all, all, I repeat, all your sins in his name, and it is erased. You want to know how successful he was when he while he was in the tomb, went and preached to the prisoners. Do you want to know what kind of luck he had? Well, listen. Verse 6. For for this cause was the gospel preached. The gospel was what? The gospel was preached also to them that are dead. That they might be judged according to men in the flesh. That is to say, those that are living after the crucifixion that they are judged under the same rules that died all the way back to the time of Noah, but live according to God in the Spirit. And you can rest assured that many of them, many of them, even those that were killed by the flood, when they repented, when the gospel was preached, then they were saved. God is not a respecter of persons. And God doesn't play favorites because of generational births. That is to say, whatever uh, time you lived in. He makes it equal for all. Don't you love him for that? Stop and think. What would it be like if we have this beautiful, beautiful choice of believing on the Son and what he did for us on the cross? And all those, even Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, all of those would not have the same opportunity. That wouldn't be fair. And your father knows it. He's fair to everyone. So Jesus went there and he preached to them. And he gave them that opportunity. And I assure you, many of them crossed over. Verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. You, <clears throat> you know you're in the generation of the fig tree, so especially that fits this generation. So be, sober means be sincere about what you believe and what you do. And you better be sincere with your father because he loves you. You know, after the price he paid for us, if we only believe, that documents his love for us. The fact that he would be so fair that he would give the people all the way back to the time of Noah the same privilege that we have today of believing on the Savior shows you how our Father loves all his children. Verse 8. And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves. That's love. Charity is love. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. You got a bunch of sins? Then let love cover them over. Your love for Almighty God on repentance. It, it covers a lot of them up. Why? Because God loves you. Mostly, as it is written in Hosea 6.6, 6, that's what God wants from you. He doesn't want your burnt offerings. 
He wants your love. Do you understand that love is the one thing God cannot and will not force somebody to do, is love him. Why? Well, you can't force love. You can't buy love. You can't order love. Love must generate within each entity. And if it doesn't, I'm sorry, they're hell bound. And that's, uh, God doesn't want a bunch of zombies. He wants the real thing. That's a person that loves him. So naturally, charity, which is love, covers a multitude of sins. It pleases our Father. Verse 9, use hospitality one to another without grudging. I mean, don't complain about helping somebody. Help them. Give them a good word. Lift them up in the Lord. Verse 10, as every man hath received the gift... Even so, minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. That grace is charis, and the gift is charisma. If God gives you that charisma, that gift of being able to take his word forward. And you know, everybody has different gifts, that different charisma to serve different purposes. That is to say, there are people that have the gift of love, of even healing, or make, and making a person, when you walk into a sick room, feel so good. That presence, that gift, and in praying for them, that's a special gift. It is charisma, which the word charismatic comes from. But then if you have a gift of teaching, a gift of preaching, or whatever your gift may be, don't, don't ever over-exercise or cease being humble in that because where did that gift come from and who does it truly belong to? Don't ever forget that. It came from God. It belongs to God. And rather than taking credit for it yourself, you had better give that credit to God. And, uh, and no one understand that, that it's his gift. And at the same time, Romans chapter 11 comes to my mind that all gifts, all charisma is given without repentance. I mean, you're not going to get rid of it. God is not going to release you from it. This is why a lot of times you'll have some preacher will slip up or somebody will and the people say, well, he's all through. Oh, no, he isn't. Oh, no, she isn't. God's gifts are given without repentance and you'd better be very careful if you put yourself in the job of judge because we have only one judge and that's God. And he has written us a letter letting us know what he allows and what he doesn't allow. So you, you start kind of trading on God's personal property and ground when you begin talking about his gifts. Verse 11, if any man speak, I mean, if any man preaches, let him speak as the oracles of God. Oracles is the scriptures of God. Not, not his own scriptures, not his own word, not his own hot air. But if he's going to preach and teach, let it be the word of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. That, that what? That God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever Amen. That's the reason. The reason being that which uh, that ability which God giveth, don't try to exceed it. He'll let you know. Follow him. Avoid evil. Eschew it. Do what's right. Love him. Appreciate the charisma, the gift from God. But always know that it is it belongs to the Father. Because Father is the one that blesses the gift when the gift is working. 
producing fruit, fruit unto our Father. Verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. This, this is the little catcher that really makes a lot of people think. Uh, you know, there is a war on. That war is between Satan and our father. Everyone likes well, that charisma. I would like to have that. That sounds so nice. That, you know, to have a gift from God. Hey, don't worry. There's some fiery trials about to follow it up. Now, you better have good faith in our Father, and you'd better believe the 12th verse of the last chapter that God knows, and he's telling you to avoid evil, but he's letting you know that when you pray for help and assistance, he hears. If those fiery darts start coming, you can cut it. God loves can-do type people. It means you're going to be tested. Why? Well, if Satan has all the dummies, well, the unlearned, in his camp, if they'll believe anything, he's ready to teach them or preach to them. He's, pretty, he's not after them all that much. He's after you that follow God and that love him. And every time he has an opportunity, when you allow it, because you have power over him, when you allow him to cast a few fiery darts at you, you better have the gospel armor on in place that stands against the fiery darts of Satan, Ephesians chapter 6. You don't have to worry about it. You can cut it. Do you know why? Well, well beloved, you're a child of God. And God wins, always. Okay. We may have a few fiery trials, but bring it on down. We can cut it. We know how to take care of it. In the name of Jesus. All right, what a fantastic chapter. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, and I must say, well, in the very next lecture, we'll be taking communion. I'll say more about it in a moment. Bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please? The book of Deuteronomy. The law was given as our schoolmaster. Have you been to school on God's word? Certainly one way to go there is to study the book of Deuteronomy. Probably the most, the most exciting thing that Deuteronomy has to offer for you is that great song of Moses that those that overcome the false Messiah in the end generation will be singing. The law itself being the schoolmaster that keeps us out of trouble in these flesh bodies. Again, an education in taming that part of you that oftentimes needs taming through the old schoolmaster, that great book, Deuteronomy, the law, and its set ways of keeping you from harm's way even in this generation. You're going to enjoy it. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, hey, all over Canada, Newfoundland. If the spirit moves, you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular individual, reverend, denomination, religion, or organization. Let's just teach his word. His word is quite capable of accomplishing what it is that we should know and what it is that we should do. And he is the judge of judges. Let him do the judging. Those of you that listen by short wave, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. Your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. Now, you got a prayer request? We can do away with that number. We can do away with the address. You know why? He knows what you're thinking. Like, like that 12th verse said, he has an ear toward your prayers and prayers when you talk to him. He knows you. He paid an awesome price to give you the privilege of saying, Father, I love you. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch.
In Yeshua's precious name, thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and we'll get into some questions here. We're going to take Patricia from Pennsylvania. I have, I have just started watching you, and I'm confused about your teaching on hell. Luke uh, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, teach hell is after the first death, not the second death. Also, torment exists, and the great gulf no one can pass over and come back from. I heard you talk about this one day, and I am now a little confused. Would you please comment again on this? I'd be happy to. Have, have these people been judged? I mean, you know, the white throne judgment doesn't come until the end of the millennium. They're simply, God is the God of the living. There's nobody dead. Not even Satan is dead, though he is sentenced to death. They're in what many people call paradise. That's what Jesus called it, basically. It is written hell, but the word in the Greek in that 16th chapter of Luke is Gehenna. That's the garbage pit outside of Jerusalem where they burn, it burn, it smolders all day and night and dead animals on it and the worms working in and out. That made it a good description of what it would be like uh, spiritually. <clears throat> and um, so these people haven't been judged and there is no lake of fire until after the second death, okay? So, uh, and then they're blotted out. I, I would recommend, uh, I have a study titled um, uh, Hell, God the Consuming Fire and Hell Fire, and you need to know the difference real good. Robin from Arkansas. Where in the Bible does it talk about guardian angels and also do we have one? Matthew chapter 18 verse 10 stipulates that if you be one of the set aside ones, that's to say God's election, then your angel has the face of God at any time need be, meaning that you need him. What, what, what does it mean you have a guardian angel? No, it simply means that he's going to make sure that God has ear, you have God's ear if you're in a problem. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. It's beautiful. It's great. Dick from California. When did the fallen angels fall, and where can I find it in the Bible? Well, you can find the fallen angels and when they fell in the Bible in Genesis chapter 6. You can find another report of it in the first six verses of the great book of Jude, right before the book of Revelation. They fell because they were called the sons of God. And they looked and they saw the daughters of Adam. They were beautiful. So they, rather than being born to them, they seduced them. And this is why the flood had to be to destroy the Geba, that is to say the giants, uh, the hybrids, so that God's plan could continue on of salvation through the seed of Adam, Ha'adam, that is to say that Christ would come. David from Arizona, where in the Bible can I find that Jesus is coming to Jerusalem to reign for 1,000 years? And please explain. Well, it's God's, number one, it's God's favorite spot in the world, Ezekiel chapter 16. But Revelation chapter 20 makes it very clear that he is coming there for a thousand years to reign. And uh, wh what does it mean to reign? It, it means to control, to teach. And there are, do you think that everyone that has died has had a perfect opportunity of knowing all of God's word? not a prayer. You got a bunch of people standing on different corners saying, you better come into this building or you're going to fry and hail like a piece of bacon. You know, or you better believe this way or you better believe that way. Don't, don't, do, do. But they never seem to get around to teaching God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse outlining exactly how the plan of God goes down providing and bringing salvation to mankind. A lot of them just didn't have a chance. There's no such thing as a second chance. They didn't have a chance coming out the gate by what's being taught in this world age. Um, you'll find a great deal more about it when we get into the second book of Peter in chapter 3. Don't miss it. 
Uh, Tim from North Carolina, in, in, in Acts chapter 8, verse 15 and 19, what did Simon see that he wanted to buy? Well, it's really pretty explanatory there. In other words, he saw the Holy Spirit working that by laying on hands, people were being healed of like leprosy. And I mean, here they are uh, spotted with leprosy and all of a sudden they're touched and prayed for and bam, they're pink and just as healthy as can be. And, and uh, people paralyzed being healed. And he says, hey boys, I'm a believer. I'd like to buy the right to do that. Well, it's not for sale, as you well know. Okay. In other words, he, when he tried to buy it, that's to say the power of the Holy Spirit, he identified the fact that he was a fake coming out the gate. You want to be aware of fakes. They're either trying to buy something or rip you off for something you got. That's to say, send money, 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 money. Now let's talk or read a scripture. Sin, money, 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 money. Let's read another scripture. Sin, money. Okay. We can't be here if you don't send money. Well, God doesn't send out beggars, okay? If, if they're not teaching God's word pretty well most of the time, uh, I'd be very skeptical. You'd, you know, if all they talk about is you sending money, guess what they're after? Duh. Well, I guess it wouldn't take long, would it? Robert from Oklahoma. Is the new Jerusalem going to be in heaven or here on earth? Will Christ reign for a thousand years or be in heaven or earth? Where did this, you know, that's, that's pretty, is that the same person? No, that's David from Arizona. Robert from Oklahoma. Well, uh, Jer new Jerusalem is coming here, okay? There, you know, you're going to, uh, Robert, I want you to be sure and listen to the third chapter of Second Peter. There's only one earth and there's only one heaven. But there are three heaven ages and there are three earth ages. Now I'm going to give you one guess. When it is the second earth age, what do you, age do you think it'll be in heaven if there's only one? The second, of course. It, eons is, you know, eon many times is translated world and this throws a lot of people. It shouldn't be translated world, but it is. And it means age is what it means. It's that world age, and there is a difference, okay? But uh, New Jerusalem is going to be right here. As a matter of fact, um, Revelation chapter 21 is not even the millennium. It's after the millennium, and it very definitely tells you that this earth is changed and and the new city is there and it doesn't it you know what you know what it's got for a temple the father and the son or the temple thereof you'll read that in uh, revelation 21 verses 20 through 24 james from north carolina how did pharaoh know that sarah was abraham's wife in genesis well, it, it says he he saw them embracing and he knew that they weren't uh, uh, they were still half brother and sister, but he knew that it was his wife then, okay, the way they embraced. Vicki from Texas. Did Jesus have, and, bes and to add, besides that, God had kind of made things happen bad for them where they knew something was wrong. Vicki from Texas. Did Jesus have any depression in his life? Was he ever depressed? And the answer, no. I, I mean, his name was Emmanuel, God with us. It's his plan. Why would he be depressed about it? Jesus was never depressed. What he did, he did for us, and he did it willingly. I know why you're saying this and asking it because of bad teachers. Because many teachers will say, well, he said it right there on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But maybe he was depressed because God forsook him. No, he was teaching Psalms 22. And as a mature student, you know that. He was never depressed. He was a good captain. He always showed strength, power, and leadership. And demanded discipline for those that would follow and receive it. Well, how does he demand discipline? Well, you're not going to get his blessings if you don't discipline yourself. You show me a Christian that isn't disciplined, and I'll show you a Christian that's probably not a Christian. 
a church without discipline is on its way out. Clint from Minnesota. Why is a blood sacrifice required for atonement? Well, it certainly isn't anymore. Why, why would you ask this question? Um, have you never read Hebrews chapter 10? Where it is written, Lo, I come in the volume of the book that he was the offering for one and all times. It is a disgrace for anyone to mention blood sacrifice after the blood he shed on the cross that was shed for you. And, um, you know, when you, somebody's got to pay a price when you sin. He paid it for us, okay? For one and all times. Quite frankly, this is why God himself would say in Hosea 6.6, 6, I don't want your burnt offerings, but I don't want your animals or your blood sacrifices. I want your love. Why did God create you? You'll read it in Hebrew, uh, Revelation chapter 4, the last verse. He created you for his pleasure. So give him pleasure and be blessed. Oh, uh, Pastor Murray, who, Linda from New York. I have a question on Revelations chapter 20, verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. You said that there are two sides of the gulf, and some will be on the other side. The, this verse seems to say that the dead won't be there. Can you help me to understand? I'll be happy to. You need to learn the difference in the Greek in nikos and nikos, nikas. Um, they, are, they are not spiritually, they are, their bodies were changed into a spiritual body, but they still have a mortal soul. Go back and reread 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52 and 53. This corruptible must put on incorruption, meaning this flesh body in a wink must change into a spiritual body. And secondly, this mortal, meaning your soul that dwells within that spiritual body, must put on uh, euthanasia, which is to say deathlessness, uh, immortality, to live forever. So though they put on the spiritual body, they're still spiritually dead, and they will remain that way until they are tested at the end of the millennium. But you've got to come to that time. Uh, uh, your documentation, again, I, I would think that would probably help you is to reread, again, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, where it says, all, how many are changed? Just the good people, just the say No, all are changed into a spiritual body. But all do not have immortality. Mortal means liable to die. And many of them that do not overcome through that thousand year reign will participate if they're not careful in the second death. I, I, I know that can be a little confusing, but um, I think if you read those verses and carefully, you will understand. But you must understand also that, uh, that uh, Luke 16 is only a parable about two actual men that existed. Judy from Iowa. I am not healthy enough to work, and my husband does work, but he forbids me to send any money to any church. How do I handle this situation? Well, if you need to get along with your husband. If he's the breadwinner, you better listen to him, all right? You don't want trouble in your home. Um, and I cannot advise you past that. You have to, you have to, um, but, uh, I, uh, you know, you tithe on what you earn. How much are you earning? You're not earning nothing. So how much tithe do you owe? Nothing. Okay. If that makes you feel better, fine. Otherwise, um, uh, you'll have to work that out for yourself. Rita from Nevada. How do I spread seeds of truth? If I act too nice, they think I am stupid. And if I act too bold, they get offended and start persecuting me. Well, you know, uh, planting seeds is never necessarily going to be a 100% uh, 
a lot of the seed, when you broadcast it, more of it hits bad places than does good places. So uh, I'm talking about the parable of the sower. So naturally, most of the seeds you plant are not going to take just yet. But don't despair because, and, and when they don't take, leave them alone. It's not your responsibility. God, only God can make a seed grow. But you see, when Rita, when you're delivered up before the Antichrist and you've warned someone that the false Christ will come first and that you'll be tried, or they will be, when they see that happening de facto, they're going to know that what you were saying was true. And they're going to realize that when a thing is declared before the fact and it comes to pass, that it's true. So don't, don't give up on the fact that all your seeds are not taking. Be patient, okay, be patient. Um, we can't save the world all at one time, and if God puts blinders on somebody, there's nothing you can do about taking them off. And God has put, as it is written in Romans chapter 11, sent the spirit of stupor or slumber, however you want to translate it, to many people, and there is no way you're going to change that. Do you know why? Because they are too weak to stand against the false Christ. And it is their protection until the millennium. That will not be accepted by many people, but it is still the truth. It is biblical. Barbara from Florida. All things works together for good that love the Lord. Where? I'm going to assume that you're asking me where is that written. It's Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Okay. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And he says there, you're for, I foreordained you. I knew you from before, all right? That's when God's uh, set aside one saints. He said, you don't even know what to pray for. That's why I will intercede in your life. And he does. Uh, Dolores from Illinois. Are there any, is there anything that God cannot do? Well, there's something he won't do. He won't make you love him. And as I described earlier in the lecture, that you cannot force someone to love you. You cannot pay someone to love you and have it be the real thing. Real love generates within an entity and goes out. And if someone loves you, you're, you're fortunate indeed. Because um, it's, it's like um, the four zun, or zoi, whichever language you wish to say it in, that guarded the uh, altar after the uh, king of Tyre fell, that is to say the cherubim that covereth Satan, S Satan being who it was. After they fell, God brought forth four zoi to guard the throne. They did not have the ability to love on their own. They were um, cherubs to the point of keep, grab, protect, guard, okay? That's all they knew. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. That's not what God wants. He wants someone that of their free will love him. That's something, and quite frankly, that's why we're here. Now, as I stated in the, at the close of the lecture, the very next lecture you hear is going to be communion. So have, have the ingredients ready. It is Passover, and Passover is approaching. So you be sure and have the ingredients present, and um, we will partake of the Passover. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, Christ became our Passover and Holy Communion is how we participate and take part in Passover at this time. So don't forget that. Be ready. Um, Martha from California. Does the Bible talk about the Olympic Games? Well, you know something? It might surprise a bunch of people, but it does. It doesn't talk about the ones we're having now, but they had them then in Greece. And you will find it mentioned in Hebrews chapter 12. The, 
What a great witness of the stars, you know, as we gather in the cloud to run this race. It's talking about a foot race at the Olympics. And um, that we gather in a cloud. It's a figure of speech meaning in a large group. It didn't mean we're going to fly off up here in the atmosphere. You can't run much of a race up there if you're not a bird, okay? And, um, and we're not birds, and, and the gospel armor did not provide a jet pack or a pair of wings. It's talking about a foot race right here on earth that you, if you're going to run one, you run her good. And you run your best, all right? So Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2 would talk, talk about Olympics right from the place where it originated. I'm out of time. Do you know what? I love y'all for a special reason. You enjoy studying our Father's letter in more depth and, and, and chapter by chapter and verse by verse. By depth, I mean the way he wanted us to in the simplicity in which Christ taught. You know, it will make your day, but the main thing, it makes his day too. It really does when you get into the letter and let him know you love him because that's what he wants. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Bless God, he will always bless you. But there's one thing most important. That's that you set a little bit of time aside each day and you stay in his word. Every day in his word, even with trouble, it's still a good day. You know why? Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.